Hello and welcome to History 3 Games and the Eastern Front Part 2. Before we get into the video I'd just like to give a couple of short announcements for everybody. Firstly I'd like to apologise for the lack of videos that have been coming out recently, uh, particularly to Patreons as well. Um, it's because I've been extremely busy and normally I do a lot of work on these over the weekends and these last couple of weekends I just haven't had to myself. Um, thus I haven't been able to get videos out as regularly as I would like. So the current schedule is this video will be going out for Patreons on Friday then regular viewers on the YouTube channel will get this on the Monday. The patrons on that Monday as well will also get a new video and regular viewers on YouTube will get the same video a week later. So that should take us back to the normal schedule of releasing at least one a week. Um, patrons getting it a week early before normal viewers get it as well. So you know if you want to see videos a week early you know where to go. Um, but also I would like to announce that this month is November or Movember in the UK. There are other places that do it as well. But Movember is a charity foundation that raises money for three great causes of men's health. Firstly is testicular cancer. Secondly is uh, prostate cancer. And the third one is mental men's mental health. Um, all three causes that I thoroughly support and therefore over the month of November I will be doing charity live streams at the link that is appearing on screen right now that is my twitch channel twitch.tv forward slash loads pc we'll be doing all sorts of different games there'll be history involved the first one went out yesterday um, if you're watching this on patreon or if you're watching this on youtube on the day this came out it was on last week it was on yeah, last week. Uh, but do check out the Twitch channel. I stream quite regularly as well. Um, but yeah, there'll be loads of stuff on there as well for the charity stuff. Um, also check out Twitter because I'll be posting things on Twitter as well about when I'm viewing and when I'm going live, etc. But most importantly, in the link below, there is a donation page for November. Get yourself over there. We've got a small target to begin with, but I want to see as much as we can. You know, anything you can give, just a tiny little bit. If none of this will come to me, and I don't want any of it to come to me. It will all go to the Movember charities um, and all of the causes they're doing as well. So, yeah, check out the link below. It's the MoBro link um, that you want to click on. Uh, I'd also, you know, like to thank patrons as well. And before I keep you too long, I'd like to get you over to the video. As I say, Please help support us this month for charity, and apologies for the noises in the background. They won't be in the video, it's just while I'm recording this little voiceover while I did my editing. Thank you very much, and enjoy! By October 1941, the Wehrmacht was close to Moscow. Yet, it had been delayed to the, due to the capture at Kiev and the attempted capture and subsequent siege of Leningrad. On October the 2nd, the plan was restarted to capture Moscow. For the Fuhrer, Moscow was a secondary objective. He had believed, and still believed, that the key to defeat the Soviets was the capture of the economic hubs. This thinking by Hitler had weakened the Wehrmacht dramatically, as well as the Luftwaffe. For the assault on Moscow, Luftwaffe II was assigned as aerial cover. In the months leading up to the Operation Typhoon, it had lost over 1,600 aircraft with another 1,000 damaged. Their strength for Operation Typhoon was only 158 medium bombers and 172 fighters, as well as some other aircraft. Overall, the Wehrmacht had been amassing a large force to attack Moscow, with three infantry armies, the 2nd, 4th and 9th, being deployed to the operation along with three panzer groups, in the form of the 2nd, 3rd and 4th. The plan for the Wehrmacht relied on the pincer and encircle tactics that had allowed the German advance to be so swift in the summer. The 3rd and 4th panzer groups would head against the Kalinin front, an attempt to cut off the Moscow-Leningrad railway. Meanwhile, the 2nd Panzer Group would move south of Tula, and the 4th Army was to attack from the west straight at Moscow. Facing the Germans were three defensive belts surrounding the Moscow Oblast. The Soviets put their newly deployed reserve forces into the action in an attempt to hold the Germans, as well as troops from the Siberian and Far Eastern military districts. The initial line of defence was the Bryanask vazuma Line. The Wehrmacht's attack against this line went to plan, and the 3rd Panzer Group pushed through the centre of the line almost unopposed and soon detached some of its mobile units to encircle Vazima by joining up with the 4th Panzer Group. Other units from the 3rd, who were more suddenly pushed round Bryansk to join with the 2nd Panzer Group and form an encirclement of four Russian armies. The encircled Russian armies, however, continued to fight, and the Wehrmacht had to employ over 28 divisions to try and eliminate them. This significantly weakened the German forces to attack towards Moscow. Soon, troops started to push through and escape from the encirclement, 
and although losses of high, some of these escaped in small groups, ranging from size from platoons to full rifle divisions. The Soviet resistance near Basma also provided time for the Soviet High Command to reinforce the four armies defending Moscow. In the south, near Bryansk, initial Soviet performance was barely more effective. The second Panzer Group had completed their encirclement and were linking up with the second army and on the 3rd of October had captured Oriel and by the 6th, Bryansk itself. But soon the weather began to change and this hampered the German forces. By October the 7th, the first snow quickly fell but also melted just as fast. This turned roads and open areas into muddy patches in a phenomenon known as Rasputisa in Russia. These muddy quagmires quickly slowed the German armour group and it allowed Soviet forces to fall back, regroup and reorganise. Soviet forces were also able to form counterattacks in some cases and a clear example of this was the 4th Panzer Division falling into an ambush set by the 1st Guard Special Rifle Corps. Along with this force was the 4th Tank Brigade near the city of Minsk. These included newly built T-34s that were concealed in the woods as the German armour rolled past them. As a scratch team of Soviet infantry contained their advance, the armour attacked from both flanks and destroyed the German Panzer IV. This, for the Wehrmacht, led to an investigation, and they soon discovered that the new Soviet T-34s were impervious to most German tank guns. At the time, the Panzer IVs were still using a short 75mm howitzer, and Guderian wrote that our Panzer IV tanks with their short 75mm guns could only explode a T-34 by hitting the engine from behind. Guderian also noted in his memoir that the Russians already learned a few things. Other counterattacks also slowed the German offensive. The Second Army, which was operating north of Guderian's forces with the aim of encircling the Bryan's front, had come under strong Red Army pressure, assisted by a superior Russian air support. According to German assessments, however, the initial Soviet defeat was high, which included 673,000 troops captured by the Wehrmacht. Although, however, recent research suggests a lower, yet still significant figure of over 500,000, reducing Soviet strength in the region by around 41%. On October 9th, Otto Dietrich of the German Ministry of Propaganda, quoting Hitler himself, forecast in a press conference the imminent destruction of the armies defending Moscow. As Hitler had never had to lie about specific and variable military fact, Dietrich convinced foreign correspondents that the collapse of all Soviet resistance was just an hour away. Yet this was not the case. The Red Army had slowed the Wehrmacht, and on October the 10th, the Germans were the bribing site of the Moashk Line, west of Moscow. They encountered yet another defensive barrier, manned by new Soviet forces. One such commander in the region was George Zhukov, who had been recalled from the Leningrad front on the 6th of October. Zhukov soon took charge of Moscow's defence and combined the Western and Reserve fronts with Colonel General Ivan Kovev as his deputy. And on the 12th of October, he ordered the concentration of all available forces on a strengthened Moshak line. The Luftwaffe still controlled the sky at the moment whenever it appeared, and the Stuka combined bomber groups through 537 sorties, destroying some 440 vehicles and 150 odd artillery pieces. On the 15th of October, Stalin ordered the evacuation of the Communist Party, the General Staff and buried civil government offices from Moscow to Kubayev, leaving only a number, limited number of officials behind. This evacuation did nothing for the morale of the Moscovites, and on the 16th and 17th of October, much of the civilian population tried the same, mobbing available trains but jamming the roads from the cities. Despite all this, Stalin publicly remained in the Soviet capital somewhat calming the fear and the pandemonium surrounding the new German advance. By October the 13th, 1941, the Wehrmacht had reached the Moshak Line, hastily constructed double-set fortification protecting Moscow's western approaches, western approaches which extended from Kalinin towards Kaluga. Despite the recent fort reinforcements, only around 19,000 Soviet soldiers were on this line, and this was far, far too few to stem any sort of German advance. Given the limited number of resources available, Georgi Zhukov decided to concentrate all his forces at four critical points. The 16th Army would defend Volokolomysk, again apologies for my pronunciations with these videos. Moshak itself was to be defended by the 5th Army, the 43rd Army would defend Myroslavets, and the 49th Army would protect Kaluga. The entire Soviet Western Front nearly destroyed after its circle near Bazama 
had almost recreated from scratch. Moscow itself was also hastily fortified, and according to Zhukov, 250,000 women and teenagers worked on building trenches, anti-tank boats, and various other fortifications around Moscow. By the 13th of October, the Wehrmacht resumed its offensive. At first, these German forces attempted to bypass Soviet defences by pushing northeast towards the weakly protected town of Kalinin, and southwest towards Kaluga and Tula, capturing all except Tula by the 14th of October. Encouraged by these initial successes, the Germans launched a full frontal assault against the fortified line, taking Moshak and Malosavlets on the 18th. Because of the increased danger from these flanking attacks, Zhukov was soon forced to fall back, and drew his forces east of the, new, of the Nara River. In the south, the 2nd Panzer Army initially advanced towards Tula, with relative ease because the Moshak defensive line did not extend that far south, and there was no significant concentration of Soviet troops to block their advance. Yet, bad weather, fuel problems, and damaged roads and bridges eventually slowed the fought German army, and Guderian did not reach Tula until the 26th of October. The German plan had called for the rapid capture of Tula, followed by a pincer movement around Moscow. However, due to the bad weather and the slowing down of the attack, and soon a new attack that was repelled by the Soviet 15th Army, on the 31st of October, the German Army High Command ordered a halt to all offensive operations until increasingly severe logistical problems were resolved and the months had disappeared. By late October, the German forces had been worn out. Only a third of their motor vehicles were still functioning, infantry divisions were at a third to a half strength, and serious logistical issues were preventing the delivery of warm clothing and other winter equipment to the front. Even Hitler seemed to surrender to the idea of a long struggle. To stiffen the resolve in the Red Army, however, and to boost in civilian morale, Stalin ordered the traditional military parade on the December 7th Revolution Day to be staged in Red Square. Soviet troops paraded past the Kremlin and marched directly to the front. The parade carried great symbolic significance by demonstrating the continued Soviet resistance and it was frequently invoked in such years to come. However, despite this brave show, the Red Army positions did not suit them any good. Although 100,000 Soviet troops had reinforced Kiln and Tula, where a new German offences were expected, the Soviet defences remained relatively thin. Despite this, however, Stalin ordered counterattacks. Zhukov did, however, protest against these attacks and pointed out the complete lack of reserves, and the Wehrmacht repelled most of these counteroffensives. The only notable success occurred to the west of Moscow near Alexina, where Soviet tanks inflicted heavy losses on the 4th Army because the Germans still lacked anti tank weapons capable of damaging the new, well armoured T 34th. From the 31st of October to November 15th, the Wehrmacht High Command stood down on the perimeter of Second offensive towards Moscow. Although Army Centrum still possessed a considerable nominal strength, its fighting capabilities had been thoroughly diminished because of combat fatigue. By 15th of November, the ground had completely frozen, which had solved the mud problem, yet had brought the cold with it. The armoured Wehrmacht spearheads, consisting of 51 divisions, could now advance, with the goal of encircling Moscow and linking up near the city of Dominic. To achieve this objective, the German 4th and 3rd Pirates of Group needs to concentrate their forces between the Volga Reservoir and Moshiach, and then proceed to the pass of the Soviet Petrograd Army to kill Achgona Gorsk, encircling the capital from the north, and in the south, the 2nd Panzer Group intended to bypass Tula and advance to Kashkara, linking up the northern Pinska and Noginsk. The German 4th Field Army in the centre would pin down the troops of the Western Front. On the 15th of November, the German tank armies began their advance. There were no Soviet reserves available due to Stalin's counterattacks beforehand, and this had made all available reserve forces to be pushed further south. The German attacks were successful, splitting the front in two. Several days of intense combat followed, and Zhukov recorded in his memoirs that the enemy, ignoring the casualties, was making frontal assault, willing to get to Moscow by any means necessary. However, despite these assaults, the multi-layered defence reduced Soviet casualties and was constantly harassed the German divisions trying to make their way to the fortifications. Eventually, however, the 3rd Panzer Army did capture Kiln after heavy fighting, and by the 25th of November, Scharlingorsk had fallen as well. Yet Soviet resistance was still strong, and the outcome of the Battle of Moscow was no means certain. Supposedly, 
Stalin asked Zhukov whether Moscow could be successfully defended and ordered him to speak honestly like the communists. Zhukov replied that it indeed was possible, but reserves were urgently needed. Yet again, German tank armies pushed towards Moscow, and the 7th Panzer Division had seized a bridgehead across the Moscow Volga Canal. This was the last major obstacle before Moscow, and they stood now less than 35 kilometers from the Kremlin. But a powerful counterattack by the 1st Shock Army drove them back. Just northwest of Moscow, the Wehrmacht priest Krasinaya Polina, little more than 18 miles from the Kremlin. The German officers were made able to make out some of the major buildings of the Soviet capital through field glasses. While both the Soviet and German forces were severely depleted, sometimes only having 100 to 200 riflemen, which is a company's full strength, left in the regiment, fighting continued. Yet because of the resistance on both the northern and southern sides of Moscow, on the 1st of December, the Wehrmacht attempted a direct offensive from the west along the Minsk Moscow Highway. This offensive had limited tank support and was directed against extensive Soviet defences. And after meeting the ter determined resistance from the Soviet 1st Guards motorised rifle divisions and flank counterattacks staged by the 33rd Army, the German offensive was stalled and driven back only four days later. And on the same day, the 638th Infantry Regiment, the only foreign formation in the Wehrmacht that took part in the advance of Moscow, went into action in the village of Dyakovo. Soon, a recon's battalion came towards the town of Kiminki, some 18 kilometers away from the Kremlin, and this marked the furthest advance of the German forces on Moscow. Soon, the Soviets went into a counter-offensive, using 18 divisions, 1,700 tanks, and 1,500 aircraft from Siberia to the far east. This meant that the Red Army had accumulated a 58 division reserve by early December. And while the offensive was proposed by Zhukov, was finally approved by Stalin, even with these new reserves, Soviet forces committed to the operation only numbered 1.1 million men, only slightly outnumbering the Wehrmacht. However, with careful troop deployment, a ratio of 2 to 1 was reached at some critical points. And on the 5th of December 1941, this counter-offensive for removing the immediate threat to Moscow started on the Kalinin Front. 